Good morning, church. It's so good to be back here. Um, I really appreciate Pastor Chris, the leadership team and the eldership for supporting us in CTI and for supporting the work out there in the community. Today, the theme that I've been given is living out Christ in community to love mercy. As we start, can I invite all of us to stand to read the scriptures together? Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Blind Bartimaeus receives his sight. Let's start together. One, two. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Matibaius, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, say Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Thank you. Please be seated. Lord, I ask that you yourself, Father Lord, would find the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth acceptable in your sight. Lord, I commit this time to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. As Pastor Chris has mentioned, this topic is part of a series on Micah 6 8. Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Loving mercy is as opposed to dreading giving mercy. And loving mercy together with acting justly, they can't really be separated. So today, although I'm talking about loving mercy, there'll be points in time when we realize that it involves acting justly. And our theme for this year and our tagline is today, loving God, serving people, making disciples. Love God, serve people, make disciples towards Christ-likeness. And leaving Christ out in community and loving mercy is part of this. How we love God, serve people, and together make disciples. The big idea today is this. Jesus cares for those in pain, the vulnerable and the needy, and restores them with compassion and mercy. Jesus cares for those who are vulnerable and needy or those in pain and restores them with compassion and dignity. What has the significance of Bartimaeus' story for us today? It is significant because today, many people are like Bartimaeus. People who normally may not be seen or heard in society. They may be there, but we pass them by. Who are the people who are unseen or unheard today? Those perhaps with special needs. Statistically, between 8 to 12% of a population of children may be born with special needs. In Malaysia, it's about 10%. It's within that range. And those with physical, perhaps, disabilities, and that usually is a much smaller percentage of people who are born with those physical disabilities. But through life, sometimes accidents happen, things happen, and there are people, more people, with physical disabilities. Refugees. In Malaysia, 150,000 are registered as refugees. And migrants in Malaysia, there are 2.6 million documented migrant workers in Malaysia, and many more, about double of that, another 
2.5, 2.6 million are perhaps undocumented migrants in Malaysia. So these are the people whom we may pass by every day and we may not think twice about them. Children at risk in the communities where we work in the urban poor, we see children loitering around all the time and they are unsupervised, neglected. And many more families who are living in other places, they may have two parents working and the children may be at risk today, not because of poverty, but perhaps due to the lack of attention. And perhaps those who are homeless and like the H.O. Uh, problem in the Bible, there are people who are begging. And last but not least, there are people in pain who may not be obvious to us. Physically, they may be okay. Financially, they may be okay. But they may have gone through tough times in life and they are in pain. But this is the relevance of Bartimaeus' story today. It is not about just a blind man who encountered Jesus but it is about these groups of people who are vulnerable and needy today. This is the story we just read, and this is the context. Jesus has been ministering for quite some time, and he had performed many, many miracles. In fact, 33 miracles have been documented up to this point, and the transfiguration had already happened, and the disciples had seen Jesus transfigured, talking to Moses and Elijah. And they knew that he was somehow the son of God. And in this chapter, in chapter 10 of Mark, he predicted his death the third time. He predicted his arrest and death. And in the midst of his ministry time with his disciples, he has just spoken to them about this very somber subject of persecution and of his impending death. And what happened? The disciples quarreled then about who is the greatest. They asked to sit at the left and at the right of Jesus. And Jesus then said, He came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. We quote this verse many times without realizing the context in which it is quoted, it is spoken. But this is the context of the story of Bartimaeus meeting Jesus. There are four categories of people, I call it, who are in this story today. Jesus himself, he has been in Jericho and now together with his disciples, he's leaving Jericho. So imagine the scene with me now. So he has spoken to the disciples and they are packed up, somber, and they're moving out. And this is the road leaving Jericho to go to to Jerusalem. It's a very dangerous road. This is the road where it's very mountainous, and this is where the context of the Samaritan story uh, was held, where people have been robbed along this highway. So Jesus was leaving with his disciples using this same highway to go to Jerusalem. And Bartimaeus, it says, was at the roadside begging. And now, who were with Jesus? It was the disciples, the third group of people. And the fourth category of people was the crowd. The crowd, nameless, we don't know how big, but there was a group of people following Jesus around. They've heard of his miracles, and in fact, they are so longing for a touch of Jesus, they've been following him around, wanting to see what is happening all the time. So let's examine these four categories of people together. So Jesus... He was leaving the city of Jericho, but he stopped when he heard the cry of Bartimaeus. We read the story just now, and we realized that there was a very big noise because Jesus has been doing 33 miracles, and wherever he goes, crowds of people follow him. And so these crowds of people are after him. His 12 disciples are already around him. If you try walking in the streets today, it might not feel like that because most people are in cars. But in those days, when most people are walking, these people are walking with Jesus. So they are keeping pace with Jesus, knowing that it's quite a long way to Jerusalem, not sure how many will follow him all the way, but the disciples were certainly going to walk with him. So there's a group of people thronging around Jesus. And Jesus thought he heard something. Then he listened again. He did hear something. 
son of David, have mercy on me. And he heard the crowd saying, shh, 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 keep quiet, move aside. And then he stopped. We knew from scripture that he stopped when he heard the cry of Bartimaeus. And we also knew that Jesus asked the crowd to call Bartimaeus. Jesus then paused and said, call him. Jesus didn't just hear, pretended not to hear, and then move on. But Jesus asked the crowd to make way for him, to call Bartimaeus. Very often, when we hear something and God prompts something in our hearts, do we actually listen and do we make space for what God is doing in our lives? Jesus was on a mission for God. He knew that he had to go to Jerusalem. His perspective was not just his uh, flogging and his crucifixion and his death, but his perspective is an eternal one. But yet, he stopped and he called Bartimaeus. Not only that, Jesus spoke to Bartimaeus directly and personally. Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Now, Jesus can very well see that he was blind. He can just heal him. Why does he speak to him? Because he was personal with him. And that brings me to my next point. Jesus valued Bartimaeus. If we don't value somebody, we will not take time with somebody and we will not be personal with that person. And when he was doing this, everybody else was waiting for him. The crowd was waiting for him. And the others, the disciples were also waiting for him. What about Bartimaeus himself? He knew the identity of Jesus. Why do I say that? I say that because he says, son of David. Son of David because he knew that Jesus was the promised one, the Messiah that was promised in 2 Samuel. And when he cried out, son of David, he was actually acknowledging him as the Messiah. And he knew that as the promised Messiah, this person has the power to heal him. And so Bartimaeus acted in faith. He cried out to Jesus. He could hear the crowd passing. He could hear the commotion. Others who could see were telling him, hey, that's Jesus, that's Jesus. And he tried to stand up. He may try, be trying at that point in time to get the people's attention, the people around him, stretching out his hand or his cane and, and the artist's impression has the cane at his feet and him kneeling before Jesus. We know that there was more than that because he jumped up. He jumped up. So he cried out to Jesus. He didn't cry out once. He cried out many times. Scripture recorded it twice, but he could have cried out many times because the crowd were rebuking him. Hindrances are only obstacles for Bartimaeus to overcome. And so for Bartimaeus, he did not let the rebuke of the crowd stop him, silence him, or discourage him. He continued crying out. He continued crying out to Jesus until Jesus heard him, until Jesus asked the people to call him. And he is sensitive to the voice of God. He responded. Now, because of the crowd and because of who he is, many people who have uh, disabilities, many others who are different from others may have experienced people teasing them, looking down at them, or despising them, saying something unkind even to them, and making fun of them. And he could have said, oh, actually, when they say, cheer up on your feet, don't know whether the crowd are playing with him or not, making fun of him or not, or trying to see, you know, trying to be funny with him. But he didn't. He recognized that, ah, this is Jesus calling him, and he responded. So he jumped to his feet, and he fell his way, and the crowd said, chill out on your feet, so they must have opened the way for him or guided him to Jesus. So he threw aside his cloak, his security blanket. And you know what? In those days, when they are out on the streets in the cold, um, the Bible reminded us this is one item of the garment that if it was sent, given in pledge, must be returned at night. 
to people because this might be the only thing, it's like their outer jacket that they wear over their tunic, and this is the only thing protecting them from the cold. And because it's bigger, heavier, and when he jumped to his feet, he threw it aside. Imagine a blind man, this is your only security blanket. This guy has faith that he will see because he has thrown off his cloak, and if he still cannot see, imagine this, he has to feel around and ask people where is his cloak, and the cloak could have disappeared, you know? So in doing that, he is actually throwing off his security blanket and going in faith towards Jesus. And as he did that, he received his sight. And the Bible tells us he followed Jesus. This was after a series of steps of him reaching out to Jesus. Then if we turn the spotlight once again and we look at the disciples, the Bible recorded for us that they followed Jesus, but it didn't record anything else. They were hearing the crowd rebuking this man, but they did what? Nothing. They did nothing. They heard Bartimaeus cry, but they did, again, nothing. Because they didn't tell the crowd, hey, you cannot say that to somebody, yeah? uh, to keep quiet or to rebuke them. You should make way for them. They had already experienced Jesus telling them to bring the children to him. And this time, again, they missed it. They didn't do anything to correct the situation. So they did nothing. Why? Why do you think they did nothing? It could be because they may have been dull in their senses and paralyzed into inaction by their emotions. Or uh, they could be indecisive. Remember the context I just talked about just now? They just heard again for the third time that Jesus is going to be flogged. Jesus is going to be uh, led to his death. And they could have been afraid. But Jesus had also said that and they were quarreling among themselves about who is to be the greatest. Maybe their thoughts are on their immediate future. And by having their thoughts on the immediate future, they miss that moment. They were thinking about what's going to happen to them. Who is going to be the greatest? And who is going to sit at Jesus left or right? Maybe denying that Jesus will be going to the cross. They don't want to hear that, so they're thinking about themselves as well. So these are people who had been with Jesus, yet they did nothing. And we mentioned as well, the, the disciples could have been fearful. And in that context, if the persecution of the leader happens, they may also think, well, what about them? the followers of Jesus. Today, if you know in political parties, if the head is taken in, sometimes some of the followers are too. And sometimes they take the followers in first before the head, right? Correct or not? Yeah, because they want to give a message to the head. So they take in the followers too. So the disciples could have been fearful as well. The crowd, this next category of people, what happened? The crowd rebuked Bartimaeus. The crowd were around Jesus. They wanted Jesus perhaps to minister to their own need first. They were not interested perhaps in Jesus ministering to Bartimaeus, but they want to know what Jesus can do for them first. And so the crowd were telling Bartimaeus to keep quiet. They don't like Bartimaeus to be around and they feel that he might be a nuisance. What else did the crowd do? The crowd actually ignored Bartimaeus. They went from ignoring him and despising him to acknowledging him as a person. Why do I say that? Well, remember this. The crowd were around Jesus and jostling to get nearer to Jesus. Perhaps he's talking as he walked. Perhaps he's talking to his disciples. They want to hear. They want to know what he's going to do next. And maybe some of them were trying to get Jesus' attention. So, they despised Bartimaeus, they scolded him, they ignored him. They had to acknowledge him because Jesus then said, call him. Well, call who? Huh? You mean the blind man there? Well, that man by the roadside begging, oh, he's blind? So then they had to say, cheer up. Somebody had to turn to him and give him the message. They had to acknowledge that there is a person in need over there. On your feet, Jesus is calling you. 
so they had to acknowledge him, open the way before him, before the blind man, guide him to Jesus. They finally acknowledged that this is the man that Jesus is calling for. How can we apply the lessons here to our context today? If we look at the categories of people backwards, the crowd, usually even in our society as well, we regard people with disability as unimportant or sometimes even as a nuisance. And this is our common cultural and societal response today as well. And very often they don't have a voice. They have very little ability to speak up for themselves. And you know what? Today, we seem to really exalt those people who are physically beautiful, strong, perfect, sportsmen, models, etc. That is what society tends to worship. But can you imagine the contrast between Nick Vujic and Princess Diana of Wales? Lady Di had it all. She was beautiful, she was a princess, she had two children, but yet, the most perhaps admired woman in the world at that time, and today, 20 years later, when we remember the tragedy of her death, her life was revisited again. Yet, it was told that she was so unhappy after her divorce that she was going out with different men. And so we are even seeing that today, in society today, physical beauty and perfection does not guarantee happiness. Nick, he has spoken here, even in Dream Center. No arms, no legs. But yet, if you look at his life, he lived life most exuberantly. He was skateboarding, he was surfing, he was skydiving, and he was playing football. If you look at the two of them, you would think, oh, but, you know, one could have been so beautiful, so successful, and had everything going for her. Yet, she died a tragic death at a point in time when she was so unhappy. So though the crowd may worship beauty, may worship strength, may think that power, success, status is everything to long for, to aspire to, but yet we see that Nick, despite his different abilities, disabilities, can live life to the full. And not only that, even today we know that the son of a Serbian refugee in Australia could make it in a multi-million dollar ministry in America where he reached out to not just churches, he's not only an evangelist. In fact, the thing that is closest to his heart is to talk to young people about suicide. Because at the age of 10, he tried to commit suicide. And this young man, at that time, a child, his parents would send him to school saying, Oh, Nick, we love you because his parents are Christians. You are special, but we love you. And God loves you. Remember that. And he would go to school with a smile, with a grin, with his wheelchair. And five minutes later in school, after being mercilessly teased, he would burst into tears and want to die. At age 10, he actually tried to commit suicide. He didn't tell us how, but he actually did try. And you know what? Since then, his mother actually spoke to him and encouraged him, and he turned his life around. I'll tell you more about that a bit later. So contrasting Princess Diana with Nick, society tend to view these as unimportant, those with disabilities, with learning disabilities as unimportant. What other categories do society regard as nuisances or burdens? And the question for us is, do we use a utilitarian measure for people? That means, do we measure people and their worth by how much use they are to us? This is a question that we need to reflect on. Not just about people with disability, but even also the, the aged, the infirm, the sick. 
do we use a utilitarian measure? The disciples, they did nothing. They were perhaps preoccupied. They were closest to Jesus and had witnessed countless miracles. And yet they missed the point of Jesus' compassion and power. Today, if we are the disciples today, we may have been in church all this while. We know about Jesus. We know about God. We know about the Son of God. We have witnessed countless miracles even here. We have seen many evangelists come and go, even Nick himself. But what is our preoccupation today? Are we preoccupied with the state of our nation today? Or are we preoccupied with our immediate future, how to earn the next dollar or how to buy the better car? Are, are we paralyzed in our emotions such that we cannot act or respond because we just quarrel with our spouse or, or we think that we should get the promotion at work and not somebody else? And we are so preoccupied with what is happening with us day to day, tomorrow, and we forget eternity. We forget that Jesus is the one who comes and brings us hope and that He is coming again. And boy, that will be the day that we rejoice because our physical and learning disabilities will all disappear. We will be given a new body. And you know what? Even our pain that is so deep in our heart will also disappear because we will rejoice in the day of the Lord. But what about all the people who do not yet know Him? What about them? What about those people? Will they get a chance to know Jesus? And have we missed the moment when people are clamoring around us to know about Jesus, but we are preoccupied? We are walking straight on past them, even though Jesus is in our midst and we represent Jesus today. What about Bartimaeus? He recognized Jesus as the son of David. So he knows somehow that this is the supernatural healer. And he acknowledged his lordship in his life. Bartimaeus was crying out to Jesus and he was healed. And he was, despite being rebuked by the crowd, he continued to cry out. What about us today? Who is Jesus to you and I today? Can you and I recognize his voice? Do we really recognize that he is the Son of God? He is the Messiah? And he is the one who is to come? And he's already come and he's already saved us. But do we know that he can continue to give us his peace? He can empower us. His Holy Spirit is with us. Do we really practice that every day? Do we say, good morning, Holy Spirit? Not only that, do we ask for the Holy Spirit's empowerment for us each day to actually live? Or do we struggle on our own? And do we actually introduce people to this Saviour? Do we recognize who Jesus is today? Is He the all-powerful one for us today that transcends all circumstances, transcends the rebuke, transcends the objections and the opposition that others have? Who is He to us today? Jesus practiced His compassionate action. He didn't only just speak to Him, but He healed Him. Jesus practiced a different value system from that of the world. He looked at the faith of Bartimaeus. We cannot sometimes realize how radical this is because often we may be among Christians. But really, when we go out as an NGO on our own, when I interact more even with different groups in society, it is really so clear that society treats those who are important with titles, ministers, they're given a special seat, escorted in or out, and you know what? Um, Jesus' value system is so different because he paid attention to this man who has been sitting by the roadside begging. And this different value system may mean us just turning around and looking at our colleague who may not be the star performer and looking at our family member who may be struggling or our friends who may be struggling and looking at their faith and pointing them to Jesus. Jesus loved the little children and the widows, the sick, the vulnerable. And the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, God is concerned for the foreigners as well. 
He even touched the untouchable at that time, the lepers. What about us? Are we able to be conformed towards Christ's likeness? Jesus restored these people towards society. He restored them socially to society. Bartimaeus was not only given back his sight by Jesus acknowledging him, not treating him just by the way. He viewed him as important and he showed that people like that are important. And my question is, did Jesus heal and restore Nick? Nick Vujic that we talked about just now. He still had no arms and no legs. But you know what? He was healed because he could face the world with Jesus with him by his side. He was restored to society. Jesus honoured their simple faith. Do we look at faith today? Are we conformed to Christ and Christ's values today? Are we His ambassadors? Because He is waiting for us to be. I want to share with you three examples today of how different ones have been changed by the Lord Jesus Christ. They are the perhaps modern Bartimaeus today. Nick, I told you, wanted to kill himself and did try to commit suicide. And today in America, he speaks to many, many high school students. He constantly speaks to them about the value of their life and looking to Jesus and not looking at their disability or what they do not have, but being able to look to God. And he thought he would never get married because who would want to marry a guy with no arms and no legs? But yet, we know today that he found a beautiful wife, Kenya, and she's Japanese, Mexican, okay? And not only does he have a three-year-old child, uh, a 15-month-old child today, in June, he announced that he and his wife are expecting twins. And you know what? God has really blessed them. And this is a man who is living his life for the Lord Jesus and making a difference not only in his community, but through his videos, through his books, he's encouraging many, many more to be able to live for God. And at that time when he wanted to kill himself and when he had gone past that suicide attempt, his mom reminded him, look, Nick, you may have no arms and no legs, but you have beautiful eyes and you have a voice. Whenever people tease you, look at you funny or talk back, talk about you as if you are not there, just begin by talking to them. Look at them, smile at them, talk to them. And as he engaged with people, they realized, hey, there's a person inside. And this is not just some weird person, uh, at that time a weird boy with no arms and no legs. Then this is someone whom God is in, and he is a person that makes a difference. What about, oh, you will say, this is just so far away. What about nearer to home? We do have examples nearer to home. Darren. Darren was 14 when he got into trouble and he got put into a youth uh, hostel. Not just a hostel, it was a, a correction home. And he was an ex-gangster and a drug abuser. So for 10 years, more than 10 years behind bars, from age 14 to age 25. And finally, in prison ministry, he was reminded about Jesus, whom he has heard about before. So he accepted Christ, and he became the first NUS law student with a criminal past. And this news report was in 2013. In 2012, he went to law school, and he went to the first day of law school uh, after orientation, because he was still in prison during orientation. He came out after orientation, and he went to class with no uh, computers, and uh, no bags and no books. So he said, how does he tell people that uh, he can't even afford a computer for his university studies? But he had to relearn his English in prison. And because he was actually really um, speaking a lot of dialect when he was a gang member, that he forgot how to speak English. 
he knew how to speak English in primary school. He forgot how to speak English in prison. He had to relearn English so that he could qualify for his law school exams. And when he came out, actually he had a job waiting for him. And not only that, today he's helping in Beacon of Life and Yellow Ribbon Project. Beacon of Life is a Christian uh, community work and Yellow Ribbon Project is a Singapore-wide project for ex-prisoners who come out and uh, be able to help them to find a job. How many of you remember the song, Yellow Ribbon? Yeah? It um, shows our age, right? <laughs> the Ye Yellow Ribbon song was actually about um, veterans, uh, those waiting for veterans re return home, and many who may be fallen in the battlefield. And Yellow Ribbon in Singapore is about uh, prisoners who have returned. And so even if you have been a person who has messed up and life has been very tough to you, and because of life circumstances, this has happened, but yet he, like Bartimaeus, cried out to God, and because he cried out to God, he was able to turn his life around. But you see, that's closer, lah, but it's still Singapore. <laughs> what about us? I want to introduce you to George Ganapati. He called himself George Kanapati Big Box. His name is Ganapati Shankar. But he actually lives in Kota Damansara PPR flats. And I will share with you how different ones uh, from the people who taught FLP, financial literacy in PPR Kota Damansara, to those who taught him drumming, who gave him tuition, etc., helped him in his life. So this is one of the financial literacy classes and uh, uh, the mother was, is the one in the centre, you can't see because it's very small, wearing red, uh, and this was one of the financial literacy classes. And it's a very tiny figure, you see any more right on, on the right there, holding a microphone, yeah? And many of you may have helped in this financial literacy classes as well. So his mum learned how to save money and his mum learned and participated in this government Satu Azam program, uh, Akhiri Zaman Miskin program. And through this program, they received sewing machines. This group of ladies went for training and received sewing machines, and they learned to sew. And uh, during the session of uh, receiving the sewing machines, uh, Radha was also uh, checking on some of their blood pressure because some of these ladies also suffer from high blood pressure. And then, when the sewing machines came for each one, uh, George helped the mother to carry these machines back to the flat. And then, George also participated in the drumming program, the drum circles that Su Chu and some of uh, her drum circle friends started. And she part he participated in this, grew in confidence, and this was the mother's graduation in FLP1. And he wanted to be part of this group that played in the celebration, despite the fact that he had injured his hand. And so there's a picture of him with his hand in a bandage. And uh, when we first encountered him, he was 13. Eh? So you can see him slowly growing taller in the pictures. And so there was uh, Su Chu there in the middle of the picture and us handling, uh, handing him a small envelope as appreciation for all those who played. Not only that, we had someone called Elizabeth Lutz from another church. Uh, she was giving tuition, and George is also one of the people attending the English tuition at PPR. And Elizabeth didn't only just teach him, he saw a difference in him and picked him up during his Form 5 year, actually invited him to stay at her house instead of staying uh, at the mom's place because PPR flat size is about 650 square feet and very crowded and uh, George's mum has many other children so five of them all together, very crowded and so in his form five years, she invited him to stay with her and she coached him in his studies and not only that, there was a lady, Karin, again from Bangsa Lutheran Church, Su Chu's church who actually asked how she could help and she uh, actually was tutoring the people in maths 
Uh, George is not in this picture, but he also went to the maths class. And today, George is doing a diploma. By the time he was in Form 5, he had gone in secondary school from the time we knew him, from the last class to the first class, you know? So he then finished his Form 5 with very good results, and now he's in a diploma course, yeah? And so you can see that he's a confident young man today. And you see him holding his guitar, he's so proud, because um, when he first came to us, he didn't know drums, he didn't know any musical instruments. But Rick from our BM congregation actually taught him the guitar. And he and his friends actually form a band. And you know what? Uh, in this youth band competition amongst the school, the better of the bands, he was a finalist. They, they didn't win, but uh, their group was a finalist group. And you know what? Today, I just want to read this testimony to you that he shared in Agape Vision. Agape Vision is an NGO which we recommended him to. They were looking for youth at risk whom they could build up. They run leadership program and performing arts program to help people, young people become more confident. And during one of these events, uh, the first picture I show you, he was doing the beatboxing. Anybody know what beatboxing is? Yeah, some of you know. Uh, it is trying to use their voice box to, you know, make sounds and do beats like uh, a musical instrument. I can't do this. Huh? I was going to try. <laughs> so he said this um, at the Theatre of Dreams in the Agape Vision event. He said this, huh? My name is Ganapati Shankar George. I come from the urban poor flats. My mother is a single mother. I have three elder sisters and one younger brother. And in fact, the younger brother is slightly special. I was sent to the orphanage since I was three years old until I was 10 years old. I was abused by people in the orphanages. When I came out and started living with my mother, when the mother got the flat, uh, I started smoking when I was 12 years old until I was 16 years old. I started smoking because I did not have people to love me or I have no place to let my grief out. I joined fights and all the negatives, he said. When I was in high school, along this journey, I met Agape Vision. There, I found that love and confidence myself to build up myself to reach my goals, and I started planning who I want to be. I want to be a beatboxer and get a good education. I want good education results. Basically, I had low self-esteem to study. Once, I even got 7G for my results. That means fail. Meanwhile, I was still smoking out there, but I found Jesus to help in all my soul. He accepted Christ in Elizabeth's church last year. He has set me free from smoking. It is now eight months I have stopped. And I have stopped everything else in my secondary school after accepting Christ. I also got good results. And yeah, he says, I'm a wonderful man. <laughs> it's been a privilege for me to be in Agape. Agape vision makes the world better. This was his testimony there, but we know from his story that it wasn't just Agape care, it, Agape vision. It was actually many, many people playing a role in his family's life, in the life, in his life as well, in his brother's life. We know about that. And the first time Su Chu and Radha met him, he was 13 years old. Till today, he's a very different young man. And many would have inputted into Darren Tan's life. And today we have a similar ministry. Yeah? Pastor Sam, uh, Steve, you, Jerry, those who work with the homeless, those who work with the uh, ex-addicts. Many of you work with also those with uh, different abilities, disabilities, learning difficulties, learning challenges. So the big idea today is that Jesus cares for those who are vulnerable and needy. I summarize it to be those in pain. Because some vulnerabilities are very obvious. When people have physical disability or learning challenges, it's, it may be obvious. But sometimes it's not obvious. They are in pain. And he restores them with compassion and dignity. Unlike the disciples, not preoccupied, he is focused on people. He is noticing people. And unlike the crowd, 
He treats them with dignity. He doesn't despise those who are weak, who are vulnerable, who are in pain. Life can be very tough for those who have made mistakes also. Life is also tough when people go through their own brokenness. And today, even in Malaysia, many families suffer due to historical or political reasons, resulting in generational poverty. Maybe those from a state background, and they suffered marginalization, which reduces opportunities for the next generation. And the Orang Asal of Sabah and Sarawak, there are some of us who are Sarawakians here, Helen, myself. But we know that the indigenous people, the Orang Asli that um, the CS reached out to just now, we saw in medical camp, so many of them are suffering from generational poverty and oppression because of perhaps historical or political reasons. Migrants, refugees, because of those politics in their own countries, they are forced to be here. Life can be very tough for those who are born with special needs or those who have met with accidents which resulted in disabilities. Today, what is the Lord reminding us? Not only in uh, the PPR flats, the other people that we encountered as well. Um, one of our staff was called because one of our uh, community people that we journeyed with, we asked them to open bank accounts because of BRIM payment, because of other payments we, and savings we are encouraging them to do, we asked them to open bank accounts. So this lady was at the bank trying to open a bank account, but she was not served because she was poorly dressed. She was poor and they didn't attend to her. And so she didn't know what to do and she had to call one of our staff. And the staff had to go to the bank and explain to the bank and actually help her to open a bank account. Many times at different counters, at hospitals, uh, they don't know how to ask the right questions. And they're often sidelined because they don't know what to say or what to do. Today, some of us may know people who are struggling. We can impact a few people or a few families at a time. Some of us, though, can impact hundreds or thousands of people with our policies and decision-making. And we need to ask these questions. Whatever our sphere of influence is, can we stop and listen? And can we encounter the pain? Jesus' encounter with Bartimaeus may seem like a moment, but if we think about it, Jesus heard him cry out. Today, you may be hearing somebody else cry out in your sphere of contact or the people you know, and even the people outside. We mentioned tons of people, thousands, in fact, millions of people in this country who are vulnerable and needy. Somebody out there are in pain. Can we encounter the pain? Are we going out there? Are we opening our eyes, opening our ears, opening our hearts? And can we hear and respond in human kindness? And this is something we have to reflect and decide on. It's not something that we can just uh, decide to do if we don't think about it. So it requires us to stop, listen, hear, encounter that pain, understand how people are feeling, and then be able to say, hey, am I going to be able to do something about this? Can I do something about this? It might be very little, but maybe it is that one step that will help George, the Georges of this world. It is that one thing that will make a difference. And why Nick is driven to talk about suicide, because he went through that, to talk about the need to open their hearts to their family members, friends, and to God. Can we hear and respond in human kindness? And can we decide to be a channel of God's blessing? We don't have to be pressured to feel that we must be merciful every time. But loving mercy means that we don't dread doing mercy. Yeah? We want to love mercy. Oh, we love doing this. And some people are just natural at hospitality. You go to their house, it'll be drinks, it'll be food, it'll be this thing that they bake and that thing that they made. You know? They love hospitality. So when we love mercy, what does it mean? It means that we don't dread 
being merciful. It, it's not a burden, it is not a pain for us, but rather it is something that we like to do. It takes leadership, self-leadership, as well as leadership of an organization or your network. It means leadership, strategizing and investing resources. Jesus had to make a decision then and then. He made a leadership call when he stopped, when he asked them to bring actually Bartimaeus to him. Here, I just want to pause because last week we didn't really talk about acting justly. By just Jesus stopping and asking the crowd to call him, actually he was speaking up on behalf of Bartimaeus. Today, many of you may be in that position to speak up on behalf of the poor and needy and to say, call him, then interact with that person and actually ask them what they want. Many policies are made without consultation. So we want people to actually make policies with consultation of the poor, of the needy, of the vulnerable. If you want, if you want to help someone in need, talk to them, ask them how you can help them because they know their own pain and they can tell you their pain. And in doing so, uh, not only can they share their heart with you, but they can tell you how you can be most helpful to them. And so, advocacy, advocating on their behalf and establishing that right for them to have access to resources. It would be a gross injustice if Jesus were walking past and the crowd prevented Bartimaeus from reaching Jesus. And the disciples were not there to prevent this injustice because they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything. They didn't tell the crowd to shut up. They didn't open the way for uh, Bartimaeus. It, it was Jesus who had to make a decision. And that leadership moment, in that moment to say, stop, I want to see him, call him. And Jesus spent time with him. So as a leader of your organization, of your family, of your networks, or even uh, where your influence extends even bigger, you can make a difference. So it can be your personal sphere of influence or a corporate sphere of influence. And I know that there are many people holding uh, regional jobs even here. And, you know, your policies can make a difference, not just to one nation, but perhaps even many nations. So whichever sphere of influence, know that if you hear the pain of the people, and this is a kingdom business, um, I once read somewhere that in business, people try to solve the pain point, you know? Uh, rich people, when they travel, they don't like to be bothered with long check-in queues, and uh, so business travel was born. And today, apparently, you can have a whistle and your suitcase come to you. <laughs> because now suitcase have chips, and uh, there are these modern tech inventions that I like reading about. Uh, suitcase can follow you. You walk and the suitcase follow after you. You know, business people love solving people's uh, pain point. Uh, yeah, it's such a pain. But this is a much greater pain that we're talking about. The pain in people's hearts. The pain that people are going through. This is kingdom business we're talking about. And God is concerned for people in pain. And He hears that pain. Not the, you know, uh, I, I don't say unimportant, those things are really uh, not something that matters that much. Yeah, we might lose, lose our luggage sometimes. It's a pain, yeah. But that pain compared to pain in people's hearts and the kind of injustice that's being visited upon people is vastly different. And so today, I just want to end with this. When we compassionately restore people to live in freedom, okay, and in dignity, we are living out Christ in our community. Jesus reminded us in Matthew 25 that if we give a cup of cold water to the least of these, our brothers and sisters, we are doing it for him. So today, I want to encourage you that we can be Jesus to the people around us. And if we have any pain in our lives, we can be like Bartimaeus. Cry out to Jesus. Cry out to God. Don't let what other people say or comment give us doubts, water down our faith or challenge our faith. Reach out in faith. Reach out to God in faith because He is there to listen. And He will hear us. He will minister His healing. It may not be in the ways that we imagine, but He will come. Persist, persevere. And this must be the umpteen time Bartimaeus may have been crying out for people to help him. But then come Jesus. 
and people around you may be saying, ah yeah, this one is just another one, another one. No, cry out to Jesus because He is here for you today. And we are reminded not to be like the disciples, so preoccupied just with the immediate future and not to be like the crowd, treating people as unimportant or despising them because uh, they are just unuseful. But we want to be like Jesus. So today, can I challenge us to reflect on this message and reflect on the people you know who may be in pain and ask God what He's speaking to you about. And for those of us journeying with these people, ask how we can restore them to freedom and to dignity. Can we bow our heads in prayer? Father Lord, we thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ for us. And we thank you that he has been our great example. And today, Lord, we see how he treats Bartimaeus. He was in the moment and he could see and he could hear Bartimaeus in need. And Lord, we pray that you will open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts to people around us that we will love doing mercy and we will love acting justly because Lord, you are the one that has saved us and we know you and you are our Lord and our Saviour and we know that you are coming again and you are bringing us back to you and all disabilities will disappear and all our pain will be given to you. You will heal us. And so today, Lord, help us to become more and more like you. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. encouraging you to, to answer what is the Holy Spirit saying to you. Could you do that right now, just for the next few seconds? I believe God has spoken. But what, what is it that one thing that God is speaking to you, turn Holy office, Spirit, is impressing upon your heart right now? You could be a Bartimaeus, you could be a disciple, you could be the crowd, or you could be like Jesus. So what is the Holy Spirit saying? Let's respond to him. Thank you, Lord. And some of us, you know, I believe God has spoken. Yell and Bartimaeus, there are so much pain in your own life that, you know, how do you in the world be sensitive to the pain outside? And I sense that, you know, before I pray, you know, for people who, who want to just be an influence, but that there are many Bartimaeus here that you are in pain, that you may not be a Christian. But this morning, the Lord may be speaking to you to say that, hey, I, I'm a Bartimaeus. You know, I need to respond to Jesus. You know, maybe you have backslided away from God, maybe. You know, you're like Bartimaeus blind in so many different ways. So if you're not, not a Christian, maybe a backslider, I want to give you an opportunity here to even say, Jesus, I need you. And I think that is the greatest invitation Jesus has given to every person. So before I continue praying, is there anyone here? that you feel like you're Bartimaeus, that you need Jesus in your life. At the count of three, I want you to raise your hand because God will see that hand and God, you know, will reach out to you when we respond to God this way. Maybe some of you are new to church here. Maybe you have never responded in this way before. At the count of three, whether down you're up in the gallery, you raise your hands. God sees your hand and I'm going to pray for you. All right. Are you ready? At the count of three, one. Two, and you put up your hand if that's you. Three, anyone here? Just raise your hand. You're not a Christian, but you say this morning, I want to reach out to Jesus. Anyone here? Up in the gallery as well. Is there anyone? Just raise your hands. Maybe you're backslided away from God. And you say to God, Lord, I want to return back to you. I want to come back to the Jesus who is calling me. Is there anyone? Because I do not want you to go away from this place without responding to God if that is in your heart. Otherwise, let me just not challenge you to this question. Do you want to make an influence? Do you want to make a difference in someone else's life? 
Do you want to turn from Bartimaeus to somebody who's redeemed by God, from Nick, you know, to someone else, from a Darren to someone else, to a new person, or George to someone else? Right? And that's the question that I believe God is challenging all of us here. Do we want to make a difference? And I want to challenge you to respond, that you may not know what to do. Right? But you say, you know, what Pastor Margaret has said, what Margaret has said, and it's something that I want to respond to. I want to make a difference in somebody else's life. And if that's you, all right, I want you to stand right now. Because I think there's, there's, something, there's something valuable in standing up to say, God, I really want to make a difference. I'm just availing myself to you. I do not know what I want to do. But Lord, I want you to use me. Even those who are, of you are involved already. You know, you can stand with me because I think as a church, we need to just indicate to God that Lord, use me to make a difference. All right? So you stand as the Lord leads you because I want to pray for you. I want to ask God to use you in a mighty way that way in the morning when you wake up, good morning, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to lead you. You'll be amazed that when you avail yourself, God's going to lead you to people, people unknown to you, a stranger even, a Bartimaeus on the road. You're going to make that difference, all right? So when you stand before God right now, you're saying, God, I'm availing myself. Thank you, Lord. So God, you see all this Lord, sisters and brothers, God, who has stood up, who is standing up right now to say, God, I want to avail myself. I want, Lord, to make a difference. Lord, I want, Lord, to do something th that you would do something through me, God, into the life of a Bartimaeus. And so, Lord, will you use us? Will you, in the coming week, Lord, lead us to someone? It could be even be a colleague at home, uh, a colleague in the workplace, or someone at home, a neighbor, it could be a stranger on the road, a lonely person in the coffee shop, on the restaurant. Father, whoever that is, God, we want to be sensitive to you. Holy Spirit, lead us to the right person this week and speak a word of comfort, speak a word of encouragement, God. So Holy Spirit, come and use us, God, in a mighty way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And we pray all this, Lord, in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Why don't we all rise right now? And we're going to sing this closing song. But this is what I sense that what God wants us to do. Now, many of you, how many of you are involved in, in, in reaching out to the community, whether you're with CES, with CTI, or an NGO outside, or you could even be cell members, all right, who are involved with the community outside. All right, how many of you are, are involved in that? Can you raise your hands? All right, can you do that? All right, just raise your hands. Now, we want to pray for you, okay? We want to ask God to use you in an even greater way, all right? So don't be afraid to come right to the front because I just sense that. God wants to just release a blessing upon you as you minister to people. Right? Can you do that? We're going to pray for healing and people in pain later on, but I want to pray for those. All right? I want the leaders to pray for you, to ask God to give you even more, a greater compassion for people. Right? Can we do that as we sing this song? Don't be afraid to stand up. All right? Be counted in the group that's making a difference all right? to the people around you. Right? Could you do that right now? Come quickly to the front as you sing this, this song here. Just come to the front. We want to pray for you. All right? Thank you, Lord. You you give life, you give love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart. keep coming because we really want to bless you leaders can you come up to the front and just pray for many of you standing here right now just release a blessing upon the leaders can you quickly come up now and just pray for them and ask God give them a word of encouragement just prophesy over them and the rest of us may be standing where you are can you pray for the people in front because these are the hands and feet of DUMC right and I pray as you pray for these people you yourself can become the hands and feet of Jesus be the people that will be involved in the community of people around you. And I ask God to lead you right now. As you sing this song, could you pray? Pray for the people in front. Thank you, Lord. 
And those of you who are not up here, can you quickly come to the front, all right? If you are involved in the community, well, don't be afraid. Come up here. Ask God for a blessing upon your life. Thank you, Lord. that you will bless God the hands and feet of Jesus that all our brothers or sisters God whether up here or even standing amongst us in the crowd God Father we pray that we will continue to use us God in a powerful and mighty way and so we ask that the Lord may every need God that we encounter that Lord will meet it and every hurt God we see Lord we will use us to heal it God and so let Lord UMC be a church, God, that is extension of the hands and feet of Jesus. And that's our prayer. Lord, every one of us standing here in this auditorium, God, Father, that's our prayer. Even those on live stream, you can be the blessing to the people around you. Ask God to lead you and be a blessing to someone. You may be meeting a George, a Nick, or even a Darren. And 10 years down, you see the great difference in their life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, bless the desires of heart. Thank you, Lord. And I want to make a last call for people, you know, to, who needs prayer for healing. And I just sense right now that some of us are very much in pain in the heart. You know, you are in pain because, you know, you, you are like a Bartimaeus. You know that the issues in your life could be an addiction, it could be a broken relationship, but God wants to heal you. God wants to bring hope to you. And so, you know, if that's you, come up a prayer. And, and I sense God also that for, for healing right now, the Lord just give me the word bones. There are some with a, a lot of bone aches, whether it's the spinal cord, whether on your knees, on your legs. Just God just want to bring a healing upon the bones, all right? So if that's you, you know, what you need to do is just, just come in faith. Like Bartimaeus has responded to Jesus and come up by faith and say, God, I need that healing, all right? So whatever your needs are, you need prayer. All right, come right to the front. We sing it one last time and then I'm going to close, all right? Thank you, Lord. Just come up in faith. You give life. But I just sense that each, each weekend, I, I always do this. Is that where you're standing right now, you can ask God for healing. All right. So if you need healing right now, you may be, not be up here because you may be shy or whatever. All right. But I believe that God wants to meet you. All right. So take your hands right now. Again, I've been teaching you to place it on that part of your body that needs healing right now. Could you do that? All right. Just take your hands. 
I believe that these are hands of blessing that God has given the Holy Spirit in you. So put that in the part of your body right now. I'm going to pray and ask the Lord, even through the faith that you may have, to bring about healing in your life. Because this has happened. It has happened in UMC quite a number of times. That as we come you know, in faith to God right now, we come Lord, knowing that it's God who heals. Amen. All right, so put your hands on that part of your body. If it's something of your heart, a pain in your heart, you know, I sense that for some of us, you know, our concerns for finances, our concerns for our children, you know, that, that is really burdening you. I just sense that God wants to bring a release in your life right now. So whatever that is, right now, place your hands on that part of your body. And then by faith right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak, Lord, blessing upon our brothers and sisters here. Lord, in that part of the body right now where the hand is placed on, in the name of Jesus, I bring healing right now, God. To the healing of the cross, God. By your stripe, you said in your word that we are healed. And even right now on live stream, you may be where you are right now, seated in a room somewhere. You place your hand in that part of your body and just ask, Holy Spirit, come, heal me right now, God. Heal me. So in the name of Jesus, Lord, honor the prayer of your saints here. Honor every prayer, God, that is lifted up to you. That in the name of Jesus, Father Lord, by faith, God, we receive that healing. Father Lord, right now we walk away from this place having experienced the blessings of God. Thank you, Lord. And so now in that part of your body, you know, just, just, just test it right now. Just move that part of your body and say, is the pain maybe a bit lesser? Just raise up your hand or, or move your feet, all right, and say, is that pain a little bit lesser? All right, we need physical healing because that is a faith action. To say, God, I pray, just pray for healing. I'm going to move my hands, I'm going to move my feet, move my head, whatever that is, move my back to see the healing that will take place, all right? And let's go faith. All right, could you do that right now? And just as you do that, give thanks to God. God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for healing me because I've seen healing taking place where people are standing, all right? And by faith, you receive that right now. So continue to be an attitude of prayer. Pray in the Spirit if you need be, if you need to. Just move that part of your body to just bring about that healing right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we put out our praise. We put out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we So to you only, Jesus, that as you continue to teach us, continue to guide us, Lord, we want that you will guide us towards Christ's likeness, God, that we'll be like Jesus. Lord, in our love for the world, there will be your hands and your feet, God, to the world and your heart, God. May the things that break your heart breaks our heart. May the things that bring joy to your heart, God, will bring joy to our hearts and so now Lord, now Lord dismiss us with the blessings of Jesus that through the cross God, we've been set free that the greatest life is the eternal life that we've given to us and let us live Lord in that hope of that eternal life and so now Lord may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the wonderful love of our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of His Spirit be with us both now and forevermore in all God's children say Amen. Amen, amen. God bless you. Have a great week ahead of you and be a blessing to someone.